Well, it is noon, so we're going to go ahead and get started with the crisis jam today. I am Laura Evans, the Director of National State Policy within Vibrant Emotional Health. Uh, as you all may know, Vibrant is the administrator of the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. I am this week's host for the Crisis Jam, so I'm very excited to take the baton from David, and hopefully we can have um, as much fun, uh, and it is just as informative. Uh, we're getting right up to the cliff, uh, as we usually do in the Crisis Jam, without going over. Uh, so I'm very excited for this week. We will have a feature presentation um, for peer support and crisis services um, that will be um, presented by Jeff Solman Rainey. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, there were a lot of comments in the chat uh, a few weeks ago around uh, kind of peer support and crisis services and the need to have this conversation. So very thankful that Jess is here with us today and will be walking us through that. Um, and so with that, we will go ahead and get started. I did want to take a moment uh, to acknowledge uh, the hurricane uh, that is coming, that has gone through uh, Louisiana and the Gulf Coast. Hurricane Ida is making its way across uh, the Midwest and towards the East Coast. Um, I, I know Stephanie has, was affected, and we have other folks here on the phone that may have been, or on the call that may have been affected. Um, wanted to open up to see if anyone uh, from Louisiana or the Gulf states wanted to give us an update uh, on how things are going there. If we have anyone there, and we may not, given uh, electricity shortages and other need to evacuate. Um, I will share uh, in case anyone. Uh, this is helpful for anyone or any of their constituencies. Uh, there is the Disaster Distress Helpline. The phone number is 1-800-985-5990. And I can put that in the chat later. Um, that is uh, the 24-7 um, uh, free uh, helpline for emotional distress related to Ida or other disasters, natural or man-made. We want to make sure that folks are supported in their mental health as uh, we recover, uh, but just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that and thinking of our Gulf Coast friends. Uh, next slide, there we go. Uh, and of course the jam continues to grow by the week. So we're very uh, happy to see that we have, of course, uh, all 50 states participating with their Office of Behavioral Health. We have 10 states that have their uh, Medicaid office and always uh, welcome to have more. Uh, I think Medicaid will be an important conversation uh, as we talk about crisis services and how to uh, ensure that we are paying for them. So welcome them at the table as well. Uh, our friends from other countries, Australia, Canada, the Netherlands, the UK, we are um, approaching 700 or at 700 on the email list, uh, over 270 participating in these weekly jams, of course, 56 national organizations, uh, you know, this, this jam is uh, kind of only as good as the people participating. So we want to make sure that uh, we keep adding uh, great groups. Of course, you all are wonderful and doing great work and happy to spotlight the work that you're doing. So feel free to join the uh, newsletter. Uh, if there's something that you want to see, uh, like uh, peer support, put that in the chat and we'll make sure that that happens. Uh, also wanted to highlight uh, a refreshed crisis talk page. Uh, and so we have the Zoom link right on the page. So you can uh, you don't have to email it or forward the invitation. You can direct people right to talk.crisis uh, now slash learning community. The Zoom link is right there. You can click it. It'll open up into the jam. Uh, we've made it easy to join the email list. You can put your email there. Uh, the videos from past crisis jams are still accessible, and uh, you can see the link there to a past crisis jam, or if we scroll down, uh, you can see the last week's video, um, most immediately there, highlighted, so immediately ready to play um, or download. So we just wanted to make sure that the site was accessible for people. Uh, if you missed a jam, I know it happens, you know, we wanted to make it easy for you to find uh, and get the update. So 
uh, very excited about this retooled page. If you have any ideas or comments, again, feel free to put them in the chat, uh, or you can uh, email David. And again, it's talk.crisisnow.com slash learning community. So we're going to keep going. Again, we're going to keep this fun and lively, and we're going to go right up to that edge. Hopefully, we will not go over. The quote from this week uh, is from Dr. Carson, and this is from the June 23rd Crisis Jam uh, on crisis receiving facilities uh, and no wrong door. And the quote is, medical clearance is a fallacy, the root of barriers to access a shield. And I think for a lot of folks who have been in this field for a while, they remember the days uh, where you needed to have medical clearance in order to uh, receive care. Uh, it is not so much, um, it, it doesn't look like the way it did then now, but there are still uh, barriers to access that we need to uh, overcome and make sure that everyone has uh, access and is able to utilize uh, the uh, great services, uh, crisis services from the crisis centers all the way to crisis uh, stabilization units. So uh, really great quote from Dr. Carson, really glad that we were able to have him on the crisis jam. Uh, and I thought that was really helpful to kind of root us into uh, the discussion today. Uh, so this week's uh, crisis talk uh, article is on 911 and first responders uh, and how they are crucial to 988 success. Uh, as mentioned, uh, Stephanie is not here. Oh yeah, uh, I was able to hop oh, on. Oh, she is, okay, perfect. Yeah. So I will turn it over to you to tease the article. <laughs> Awesome, thank you, Laura. Um, yep, so uh, this week I talked to Margie Balfour. I know most of you know who she is, um, but Dr. Balfour is the Chief of Quality and Clinical Innovations at Connections Health Solutions. In the article, she shared with me that the best way to ensure calls are diverted from 911 and first responders to 988 is by building robust partnerships with them. Um, and she indicated that at every point, every entry point, first responders must be able to easily and rapidly connect people to care. Um, Margie, are you on the call? Yep, I'm here. Awesome. So if you could share a little bit, you know, what I think two areas, um, what, you know, we see over and over again, what happens when first responders don't have a crisis system to connect to, but you've been doing this for 15 years in Tucson. So if you could talk a little bit about lessons learned um, and a little bit about uh, the article um, and how in Tucson police and behavioral health crisis providers have worked together for a long duration of time to develop not just a partnership, but an ongoing partnership with feedback loop um, and connections that are meant to be ongoing. Sure. Um, yeah, down in Arizona, we've talked about the Arizona model before and that it's a pretty robust and mature model. Um, Tucson is a unique community in that it's very collaborative. And so the, the crisis system there really started back 20 years ago with just CIT and one mental health court. And then over the years, you know, the community gets together and um, it, there's a lot of crosstalk. And so as the crisis system has been developed with crisis lines and crisis mobile teams and crisis facilities, the community is really in this ongoing dialogue of how can we work better together and you know from both sides um, we've been very fortunate that the tucson police department as well as pima county sheriff are both very progressive in terms of mental health and they they want to do a better job so they're at the table um, not because they have to be because they want to be and that comes from their ownership on down and then on the crisis side it's kind of part of just the crisis culture is that we treat law enforcement as a quote preferred customer because they have the patients that we want to divert into clinical, you know, into crisis care instead of jail. So, you know, it's, you know, we started off, you know, with, um, you know, there's a crisis line and there's mobile teams and there's, and there's the facilities and they are, there's easy access for law enforcement. But then more recently in the last couple of years, since like January, 2019, um, mm -hmm. the community started to look at 911 because the further upstream you, you identify the calls that need to go to, to the mental health system, the better. 
you know, there's a lot of talk about co-responders and things like that. And we're trying to, to get even before that, where mm -hmm. you're not trying to triage what needs to happen to the call or, you know, to that person in the field, but you're, you're identifying it as early as possible and diverting it to a clinical only response as much as possible. So to capture that call when it comes in, realize that it's a mental health call, have the, the, um, the crisis line staff is co-located with 911, although right now it's virtual because of COVID, but mm -hmm. hopefully we'll right. be back. Um, but it'll you know, recognize that that is a mental health call, get the crisis line staff to be able to do an intervention on the phone. And I think some of y'all have seen my little graphic that shows how you know 80% of those can get um, resolved on the phone. I think it's a little bit lower for the 911 calls because they are a little higher acuity. I think it's mm -hmm. closer to 70%, I think. Don't quote me on that though. Um, okay. <laughs> but then, you know, then if they need to dispatch a crisis mobile team, then the crisis line handles all that dispatch. And so then you get a clinical only response and only, and then only need to involve law enforcement if necessary. And, you know, so that, that's the system that we've, we've really tried to build. And then, you know, we've also got after the crisis and outreach before the crisis. And that's where um, for Tucson police, they found um, a more targeted use of the co-responders, the peer co-responders for some different programs like a homeless outreach team and a, a public safety risk assessments and, and overdoses and things like that, where then they're kind of helping in that not urgent stuff because the urgent stuff is at the 911 level being diverted. So that's the goal. Of course, it's continuous quality improvement. Um, we were actually just talking yesterday that looking at the data, um, a large chunk of the calls that are coded by 911, you go back and look at them and they should have been coded to something different. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so, so identifying those as mental health calls, I think is, is you know, that's the current challenge is to figure that out. Um, you, so that you it's mentioned you know, the also, right response every time. You mentioned also the cultural shift um, and that in Tucson, uh, the police department really views their role through a public health lens and community safety lens. Can you talk a little bit about this distinction between guardians, not warriors, and what that means? Sure. And I'm sure that people who are actual law enforcement folks can maybe articulate uh -huh. this better mm -hmm. than me that's sort of trying to figure it out from the behavioral health side. But um, this, you know, the, the kind of old school, um, you know, police are the enforcers. That's the kind of warrior mentality where they're there to fight crime and, you know, lock up criminals and which they, they still do need to do that. Um, but the, the guardian takes a, a more, to me, seems like a more public health approach where it's, we're trying to protect the community and keep the community safe and elevate the community. Um, and that's where the, this idea of community policing and um, Obama's 21st century, um, you know, policing report that talked about moving, shifting towards more community policing, where you're not, it's not the police versus the community, it's the police are part of the community and keeping it safe. And so, you know, we talk about um, community safety and it's not just, well, getting these dangerous mentally ill people like treatment, it's community right. safety because if you're getting people the care they need, um, then that whole community is gonna be better. And if you're freeing up law enforcement from you know, doing useless things like sit in the ER for hours with people they're trying to connect to treatment, then they can go and do more you know, actual police work. RJ, I love that. And I think it's highlighted in the chat, you know, elevating the community. Um, this is so important. And I think I saw a stat something of like 20% of law enforcement time is spent on the transportation of individuals in a mental health crisis. Certainly, I'm sure they want to free up their time. Uh, I'm glad they're on board or you know, the conversations are happening around 988 and making sure we're um, using that mental health approach uh, instead of a public safety law enforcement approach where it's not appropriate. Uh, highly encourage everyone to read the article. I think there's some really great stuff in there. Thank you, Marjorie. Yeah, I, just, uh, and I just saw a question in the comments about um, has this led to less racial profiling and violence? That's a, still an open question, but Tucson police have in the last year, they now have all of their data on their website with, you know, you can download it and analyze it yourself. So they're, they're really buying into transparency. transparency. In the community. Yeah. So yeah. just want to put that in and I'll be quiet yeah. now.
Yeah, no, so this is so important. Uh, I'm glad to see it's trending in the right direction. Hopefully we can get some more data uh, to make sure that it's actually going where we think it's headed, but it sounds like a lot of great work going on. So I really encourage everyone to read the article. Uh, next slide. Okay, so at this point, I'm gonna turn it to our friends uh, at SAMHSA, uh, Dr. Anita Everett uh, for an update. Great, thank you, uh, Laura. Yep, so it, we've been very busy at SAMHSA. We're in a phase right now where we're um, socializing or sort of getting the word out to important stakeholders regarding um, uh, 988 itself and the timeline that we're on with regards to that. So that's included multiple presentations to um, our Interdepartmental Serious Mental Illness Coordinating Committee, the Behavioral Health Coordinating Committee within HHS, and also our National Advisory Council. So there's been a lot of that, those kinds of uh, activities. Uh, as I suggest, as I sort of brought up last week, we are also in the process this week of uh, a convening, a national convening that's for areas two and three, the Health and Human Services regional areas two and three, um, which are which is the Mid Atlantic, uh, basically. And we, there we've convened um, Medicaid directors together with uh, behavioral health authorities and um, substance abuse um, administrators uh, at the state level in those states to hear, to create a community, to hear uh, presentations initially from our assistant secretary at SAMHSA, Miriam Duffin Whitman, as well as the director within CMS, the director of CMCS at the Center for Medicaid and CHIP Services, uh, Dan Tsai, um, uh, headed, up, headed out the me up the meeting or sort of initiated the meeting, started, kicked off the meeting. We've had presentations from Ohio on their statewide process from Arizona uh, today. Uh, Monday, we had a presentations from uh, Missouri, from Georgia, uh, and uh, from a county in um, Oregon that had taken up crisis services. So we're, the part of the intent of this meeting is to demonstrate a lot of different models, uh, some of which the state policy directors, um, the policy, you know, rule, policy uh, individuals, um, decision makers can pick up in their state. So it's been a very um, exciting dynamic meeting and it concludes on Friday. And if it works well and, is, and we get good reviews, we're going to planning to take that to other parts of the country uh, over time. Uh, let's see, otherwise, I think there's some details of, you know, with regards to, we were working on the reports and I will turn over at this point to um, the reports that were due or are due to Congress. Um, those are in clearance right now. Um, let's see, I, I see uh, Rich, John, Dr. Palmieri, we'll just turn over to the different members of our team at SAMHSA. Dr. Palmieri is not with us, I don't believe. So Richard McKeon. Yeah, thank you, you thank you, thank you, Anita. So as Anita referenced, there, you know, there have been, you know, lots of questions about the timing for the reports to clear, the reports to Congress required by the Hotline Designation Act. Those are now, in, have now entered the clearance, you know, process. So we will certainly keep uh, people informed and let folks know when they um, uh, uh, are, are actually out and transmitted to Congress. We continue to work on multiple what are called TA requests for, on, from the Hill. Um, um, and, you know, and these are requests where uh, SAMHSA is asked to provide uh, uh, information and, and uh, technical um, uh, programmatic um, uh, information uh, regarding things that uh, are being looked at uh, by congressional uh, offices or congressional committees, uh, either on authorizing legislation or on appropriations. So th there's really been almost an unprecedented level of requests in that regard, that I think reflecting the high level of interest in the, in, on the Hill uh, around 988 and the lifeline, but also around a broader array of suicide prevention and, um, and mental health uh, related um, issues. Uh, SAMHSA is continuing to uh, expand its team working on the 988 um, and related crisis service um, you know, issues. So we will continue to update you on that, Anita. Um, uh, introduce some of our new team members, I think, uh, uh, two weeks um, ago. 
Um, SAMHSA is also um, working in coordination with the FCC and the VA on the uh, texting issue that is currently, um, uh, that uh, the FCC has issued their uh, further notice of proposed rulemaking on it. And we've been providing them uh, technical information regarding uh, the functioning of the texting service that's now part of the National Suicide uh, Prevention Lifeline. And this is part of the FCC's due diligence in uh, uh, um, examining and taking input and looking toward their next steps uh, regarding the issue of texting to, um, to 988. So anyway, that's what I have. Great, thank you, Richard. I do see John, Dr. Palmieri, anything to add from the SAMHSA perspective? Yeah, sorry, I got on the call late and I don't, I don't wanna duplicate anything, but the, I guess the only thing that I didn't hear Richard say specifically is, um, you know, as, as we're sort of focused on a number of pillars of, of work effort with respect to 988 implementation, certainly the reports um, and, uh, and the TA that Richard references one and the communications piece that we now have a lead on is another. Um, and it's sort of now um, we're really squarely focused on operational readiness um, and really trying to build some uh, additional supporting capacity around making sure that um, the call centers uh, and uh, states and localities are, are optimally prepared and ready for 988. And so we're going to be shifting much more attention in that area um, uh, moving forward. So I just, I just wanted to highlight that. Thank you. And I see, I see Eitan Rask is there as well. Eitan, anything you need? would like to add? We don't, we don't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just gonna add, building on what John said, um, I think in terms of operational readiness, we think about this at, at a few different layers. One is obviously the lifeline administrator and everything that, um, you know, Vibrant needs to have a successful launch in July. A second layer is at the local crisis center level, making sure that the capacity and resources exist there. Uh, and then a, a third could be thinking through how all of the different 911 piece apps are going to interact uh, as well with the launch of the lifeline. So I think those are just a few of the different layers that we've been thinking about as we think about operational readiness and, and more on that to come in, in future weeks. But I do think to echo John's point that that is going to be a huge, uh, you know, continued focus, at least from the SAMHSA standpoint. Great. Well, I, oh, sorry, Anita, were you going to say something? I was going to say that concludes the SAMHSA report. Thank you. <laughs> well, it's informative as always. And I know, you know, at least from Vibrant's perspective, and I'm sure from the others here on this call. We're just so grateful for your leadership. Very excited to hear that the reports are in clearance uh, and looking forward to the road show. I know I've seen some comments in there to um, you know, ensuring that public health is a part of the conversation as well as mental health and just really um, happy to see and, and hear that that may be coming. So thank you all. Um, at this time, I think we're gonna shift over to Dr. Hepburn, Brian Hepburn of Nashbed and see the updates from the states. Thank you, Laura, and uh, thank you for all you do. You look good. Look good in this position. You sound good, so thank you. I uh, want to thank SAMHSA, uh, the leadership uh, that put from, from Anita and her team. Uh, it's very been very helpful. Also want to uh, thank Margie. She's uh, somebody who we all love to listen to. She has so much experience. Um, it's really nice uh, to hear her, especially talking optimistically about working with 911 and first responders and law enforcement. And she's figured out how to do it. And uh, I think we can learn a lot from her. In terms of specifically what the states are addressing, thank you, Laura, for bringing up the issue of Hurricane Ida. Uh, I think uh, uh, anybody who's watching the news is able to see the devastation in Louisiana, uh, Mississippi, uh, other Gulf states. It's uh, at a time when we're dealing with COVID-19 and returning kids to school as if uh, life isn't tough enough, uh, there's a hurricane thrown at, uh, at people. So we know that uh, kids and parents' uh, mental health is being affected, not uh, that it's being affected long-term, but right now I can tell you there are a lot of anxious parents out there and our states are trying to be helpful with them. 
another area that the school that uh, our states are working on is workforce. Uh, as uh, as we try to deal with all these crises, uh, workforce and behavioral health is a significant problem. So it's something every state is working on. I also want to just say quickly uh, something that uh, Anita talked about, and that is that SAMHSA has started these regional meetings. Uh, and this has been brought up in uh, uh, other uh, of these Wednesday meetings, the importance of SAMHSA and other federal partners helping to come up with a way to sustain some of the one-time only federal funding. And so SAMHSA and uh, CMS are coming together uh, with uh, team leaders from Medicaid and behavioral health and trying to establish a comprehensive and integrated crisis system. And the first region includes Delaware, DC, Maryland, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and West Virginia. I've had the pleasure of sitting in on the calls and they've been excellent, really good presentations. And uh, the plan, as Anita said, is uh, take these across the country. And I think it will be very helpful to states to be able to talk internally with their teams that include their Medicaid leadership and their behavioral health leadership. Uh, just real quickly, uh, among the issues discussed on that call so far uh, are, is the issue of no refusal, no wrong door, the issue of medical clearance, the issue of sustainability. So many of the issues that have been brought forward on uh, this call are really being discussed uh, uh, among state leaders and federal leaders on, these region, uh, on this regional call. So I wanna thank SAMHSA for this. I wanna thank uh, Anita for her leadership. And uh, with that, I'll pass it back to you. Thank I just you, wanna Laura. thank you, Brian, for your leadership. It's really important. I, I know the states are constantly facing issue after issue. So really glad to have your organization um, there to help amplify that voice. So thank you, Brian. Um, next slide. All right, so at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Sarah to give us an update uh, on the federal activity. Sarah Corcoran, are you here? Okay, doesn't look like we have Sarah. So let's see if Natalie Tegent, Taylor or Laurel from AFSP can fill in for us. Hi everyone, good afternoon. I do not have an update on my end. Okay. All right. Hey, Natalie, this is Richard McKeon from SAMHSA. Can you give a, a, a status update on the National Suicide Hotline Improvement Act? You know, that passed the House. We came was that a committee. Um, maybe you can give folks a sense of where that stands. I think you heard on one of these calls previously that there was going to be an effort to ask that the majority leader would ask for unanimous consent for it to pass. The Senate, uh, what can you tell us? Sure, Dr. McKeon. So at this point, um, it did pass the Senate Help Committee. And so we are waiting to see what the next steps are for it to go through the full Senate. Um, and since the bills are different, the bill that passed out of the House and the bill that passed out of the Senate, how we'll have some differences to reconcile. Um, we can expect that once it passes through the Senate, it will have to go back through the House. Um, I actually just did some follow-up on that piece of legislation today. So hopefully I may be able to provide an additional update uh, next week or the week after. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Natalie. Uh, Natalie, have you heard anything regarding uh, reconciliation um, or um, the process for uh, kind of using that mechanism to get additional funding for crisis services? Any, anything new there? Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> Definitely. Um, I know that AMSP is absolutely supportive of there being additional uh, funding towards crisis resources. And I know that we're working with you and some other organizations on perhaps um, funding for centers and for um, additional resources that would help with the continuum of crisis care and a down payment reconciliation. Um, I don't have much to share on that end besides it sounds like it'll be heating up over the next two weeks or three weeks rather. Okay, great. Thanks, Natalie. I think the um, House ENC is scheduled a September 13th markup, so we'll, um, I think that's three weeks away, which we'll be here rapidly, as Natalie mentioned, so definitely keeping our eyes on that. Thank you, Natalie, and the AFSP team. All right, so we're going to keep the jam jamming, so we're going to go, uh, and I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Angela Kimball, 
uh, to have a brief uh, state update from what the NAMI folks are tracking. Hey, thank you, Laura. So uh, not a lot going on right now. We are still in the midst of two states where there are challenges with the governor. So New York State, uh, we, we know the governor resigned. Uh, the legislation around uh, 98 services has not yet been signed. Uh, everything that we're hearing, though, is that the state mental health division is moving forward to try and implement what the bill says, even though it hasn't been signed into law, and basically requires a report uh, by the end of this year. Uh, in California, uh, again, efforts to recall the governor are creating some challenges in terms of moving AB 988 forward, still moving, um, though, still efforts. Uh, and as you're aware, the majority of states, uh, their legislatures are, are no longer in session. So, so in many states, uh, what's happening now is a preliminary planning for efforts for next legislative session. Great. Thanks, Angela. I know you have a great team uh, that is working to help people who are looking to put forth legislation. So if any uh, other organization hasn't already been in touch with Angela and Nami, feel free to do so because they are leading really great work. Uh, so I guess I'll turn it to Paul and Tom. I know David gives you five seconds for a calculator, but I think I can give you a little bit more. <laughs> Paul or Tom, are you all here today? All right, they are I not here. I'm, I'm so sorry. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Got stuck. Um, look, uh, one of the things I'd give as a reminder right now is we've we've been looking state by state at this, and we did some work with Utah looking at their numbers. And as they've uh, worked on funding their system, I think the key is uh, we encourage you to start using page two of that calculator, Laura. I know you spent some time on that yourself, but it's really about not only looking at what the total cost of funding is as a projection, and that means looking at what your mobile teams would cost you, what your facility-based receiving centers would cost you, but also let's dig down a little deeper, look at your payer mix, look at your federal matches, and if, if you look at those closely enough, it starts giving you some good insight into what it's going to cost you as a state to actually fund these services. And, and ideally, uh, I always like to give this reminder, and Angela, I, I lean into this a lot, but it's parity. And parity is really important for us. And if we can get parity in there, what you're going to find is nearly half of the projected spend for a state on serving for mobile crisis services and crisis receiving centers would actually fall into insured individuals where parity is enforced yet. So those commercial payers, Medicare, aren't paying their part. So I think that's one of the real key pieces for us right now. And uh, Laura, the other thing is, as we're always happy to help anywhere we can, but those who haven't dug into the calculator yet, if you go on NASHBIDS, www.crisisnow.com and look at tools, it's a spreadsheet, it's editable and uh, certainly available for everybody. Yes, thanks, Paul, and really encourage folks. If you're considering uh, what that fee may look like, what the needs are around mobile crisis team um, and crisis stabilization units, really helpful. Um, so we're going to move forward and turn. I'm going to turn this over to Don uh, Yoey of Nevada to talk through uh, their recent state le legislation that passed that does include a fee mechanism. So if we go to the next slide, I'll let Don take over from here. Good morning. Well, it's morning here. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> um, I don't see the next slide up, but Karen, can we go to the next slide, please? Go ahead, Dawn. I'm sorry. We'll, we'll okay. catch up to you. That's fine. So um, in our last legislative session, SB 390 was passed. Um, SB 390 allows our Nevada State Board of Health to set up a 988 fee for up to 35 cents. And the 988 fund is actually a sequestered account, so it will not revert back to general fund at the end of the year. Um, we combined this bill with our opioid litigation fund. And so sections seven through 14 of the act relate to our opioid settlement litigation funding, known as the Fund for Resilient and Resilient Nevada. In order for any of the activities to be funded out of the Fund for Resilient Nevada, it must be identified through a needs assessment process. 
determined to be a priority and then allocated funding within the state plan. In section 9.6, subsections 6 and 14, crisis services and the hotline are both identified as possible activities that could also be funded out of this fund um, in addition to the crisis response account. We um, use the John Hopkins guiding principles as framework for the fund sec sections in this legislation. We do not directly allocate funding to any activity within legislation, only allow for such allocations to take place should the activity emerge as a priority. priority. Um, and of course, evidence-based practices need to be able to support the activity. This legislation passed with bipartisan support. Both houses had to pass the bill by two third majority vote in order to implement a fee. Uh, we're currently working on regulations. And so we're going to be adopting regulations um, that establish the qualifications for providers, communication and sharing of information when responding to crisis and definitions for qualified behavioral health providers. Money um, may be used for 988 operations and technology, mobile crisis, crisis stabilization as authorized by 47 USC 251A. Um, yeah, so special thanks to our senators, Senator Raddy and Senator Kikefer uh, from both sides of the house, as well as the Senate committee on HHS for supporting the legislation. Thanks, Don, and I apologize that we weren't um, able to get your slides up, uh, but that's the jam, right? And we're just gonna roll with it. Uh, could you, uh, and I may have missed this, Dawn, uh, let us know kind of what the estimate was, if you all produced one regarding the revenue that could be generated year over year with a surcharge, a 98 yeah. surcharge or fee? Yeah, so the anticipated revenue is a maximum possible revenue of $13,300,000. Um, $13, annually. Great. And certainly having that uh, annually, year over year, could uh, help crisis services. And so always encourage states to consider uh, if a fee is viable uh, for your state and certainly using that to supplement, not supplant uh, already state existing um, support. So we are gonna transition over now to the feature presentation of peer support and crisis services. Um, uh, Karen, are we able to get the slides back up? You want me to try and share my screen instead? Yes, in the interest of time, let's see if that works, Jess. Um, and, and I will, you know, Jess is our feature presentation. Very uh, grateful to have her here and share her expertise. So I will turn it over to you if you're able to share your screen. All right, can folks see that? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. Um, so I wanted to talk first about some of the different things that get called peer support so we can get clear about um, kind of what I'm referring to. Sometimes um, in our organizations, workers with lived or living experience who have their own direct experience, but it's not a credential and occupy clinical or other behavioral health roles that are not trained in self-disclosure or peer values get called peer workers. Um, so that's not what I'm um, hoping to talk about today. Um, we also see folks who are family members of people with lived or living experience who don't have their own direct experience, occupy peer or family specialist roles and focus on supporting engagement in clinical interventions, get called peer workers. Um, again, not what not the focus today. Um, and then the, the last two kind of categories are folks with lived, ex, lived or living experience who have their own direct experience um, and occupy peer worker roles. Um, are, are, uh, there's two kind of types. One is folks who are focused on supporting clinical engagement um, or engagement in clinical interventions. And then folks who are trained in alternatives to traditional mental health treatment. Um, I'm going to focus on uh, the last category of peer workers who are trained in alternatives, which doesn't mean that those folks are um, only going to support alternatives to traditional mental health interventions, but um, that they have a broader scope than people whose goal is to just um, help people engage in current treatment options. Uh, this lines up pretty closely with SAMHSA's crisis national guidelines about what peer workers are supposed to do. Um, so this kind of category is where I would like us to focus for the development of 988. 
uh, when peer support is considered a true alternative, um, it's a system of giving and receiving support that's rooted in respect. People have shared responsibilities with the peer worker and the person receiving services for interactions and outcomes. There's mutual agreement about what is safe and helpful that's determined within interactions. It's not based on a psychiatric or medical model um, or diagnostic criteria and moves beyond self-concepts built on disability diagnosis and trauma. Um, so that's some of what I'm talking about when I'm talking about peer support under this framework. There are lots of different types of crisis intervention. And I think for 988, we're really focusing on mental health first and ideally peer support first models as well. Um, the FCC really opened the door for this to be a possibility that we would have peer support first interventions uh, when they added peer support into the legislation, which is really exciting. So peer workers can and do work in any of these spaces. Um, the presence of a peer in, in an engagement is not the same as a peer support response. So I think that's really helpful to know is that just because a peer is going with law enforcement, that doesn't mean it's a peer support response to, um, to a call. So uh, when we have a peer support response, that means that people are able to actively engage using their own choice with a peer worker without a clinical gatekeeper. Um, so mental health first responses are gonna be things like a crisis line, mobile crisis, walk-in and crisis residential where peer support might be um, added, an added benefit. But a peer support first model would have the opportunity for someone to directly access peer support workers through a warm line or crisis line, mobile response drop-in and peer respite. Um, so that's what it looks like if we build out a continuum of care that is peer support based um, that goes alongside our mental health model. So to support peer workers in crisis settings, um, we need to make sure that we are setting up a situation in which peer workers won't experience harm. Um, so peer workers can experience harm when we're dishonest about power. Um, that we know that clinical staff tend to have power over peer workers. Um, when we lack accountability processes, when we're tokenizing people, when we only select people to do peer work who agree with us, um, when we fragilize our peer workers, and when we involve them in coercive interventions. Uh, those are the times when peer workers can experience harm from, from working in these environments. Uh, we did a workforce survey of peers in our crisis system at all levels of our crisis system. And some of the things that we heard, the challenges we heard people were encountering were that there were a lack of peer support policies and processes, that they were reporting up to clinical staff, that they had clinical and not peer supervision, um, that their coworkers had misunderstandings of what peer support was. So peer workers were engaging in um, doing things like screening and assessments or um, intake paperwork as opposed to peer support. Um, that their work assignments weren't peer support. So sometimes they got assigned to doing things like, like laundry in their clinical setting and things like that instead of um, actually engaging in peer services. That they felt they, they were unable to survive on peer salaries, uh, that certification was inaccessible and professional development was actually focused on clinical care and not on peer support. Uh, so when we are going forward with 988, we need to make sure that these challenges are being addressed. And I think we have particular interest in addressing um, policies and practices that are and processes that are um, very clearly laid out for how people engage in peer support. I think that's really critical that peers are given peer supervision and that their professional development is um, focused on, around peer support and that we're looking at parity or equity between uh, the salaries of crisis workers in the clinical space and peer workers who are responding to 988 as well or, or the continuum of services following 988. So when we start to look at peer support um, under 988, I think it's really useful for us to consider how people access peer support. Um, our callers deserve options. I mean, in the past, the Lifeline's taken um, critical opportunities to provide our callers with Spanish language options and veteran specific options. And the FCC really opened the door for peer support and crisis services. So we know that many people feel supported by clinical interventions, but not everyone does. And peer support offers a pathway for individuals who have been harmed by or have reason to mistrust traditional mental health supports. 
we would be remiss to kind of pass up this opportunity that the FCC has given us um, in favor of peer support that has clinical gatekeeping around it um, or have um, a vague or unhelpful mandate that just says you can use peer support in your, uh, in your 988 implementation. Um, so some of the recommendations that I have are about considering some IVR options. Um, if we do an upfront IVR option, um, like we have the veterans and the Spanish uh, options, um, not all centers have peer support, so that could pose some challenges. So my suggestion um, is that local centers who are able to offer peer support as an alternative are able to um, provide that IVR option when people get routed to their local center um, so that people can choose before they get directly connected to um, a clinical staff member so they don't have to go through a clinical screening in order to access peer support, um, a peer support option in their IVR system. This aligns with um, SAMHSA's core competencies for peer support. Um, one of the core competencies is that peer support is voluntary and peer workers are partners and consultants with the people that they serve. They don't dictate the types of services provided or the elements of recovery plans that guide their work with peers and participant, participation in peer recovery support services is always contingent upon peer choice. Um, if we have people doing some kind of clinical screening, um, people don't have the choice to choose peer support right out of the gate. They have to go through a clinical intervention first. So when we start thinking about preserving the practices of peer support in a meaningful way um, under 988, uh, through calls, chats, or texts, whichever way you're going to offer peer support in your local center, um, we're going to want to make sure that we are providing alternatives to traditional crisis intervention and not just replicating the same interventions that you get on a crisis line, that we're not doing screening and assessment in the traditional way that we're using peer support interventions. Um, my, my suggestions are that people consider um, organizations like intentional peer support and alternatives to suicide to train their staff in these things. Um, that we're not using coercive interventions um, and that we have different standards from just least restrictive interventions that we're thinking about when we're working with peers. Uh, that the engagements are mutual and not paternalistic so we're not driving people to a specific end goal. Uh, that safety is defined within the relationship in that interaction, not by policy and process. That we have some separate guidance for the average interaction length, volume, occupancy, and all other call center data that there's pay equity with our peers, and that peer support infrastructure in organizations is uh, developed so that peers are not reporting just directly to a clinician or clinical staff, that peers have multiple levels of other peer workers um, to move up, move up to, um, so that they can both move up within the agency and that they're being supported around peer support work and non-clinical interventions. So well, that was my very quick version because I know we're a little bit behind. Um, so I'll stop my share. And then if folks have any questions, I can answer those. Well, Jess, I want to thank you for that presentation because it is so illuminating. Uh, and I think a lot of times you're right that there is that clinical gatekeeping. The presence of a peer really tokenizes them because it isn't that peer support response. So I thank you for bringing that to to our attention and I thank you for the survey. I think that is so important. And I see in the chat, there's a lot of discussion around the salaries not being equitable. That's so important for this work. Um, so really appreciate you, um, you know, for this presentation. And at this time, we're gonna open it up for the round table with uh, Lisa St. George and Dr. DeQuincy Lazine um, to discuss um, how we can better incorporate peers into crisis support. So uh, Lisa and, and uh, Dr. Lazine would love to have your thoughts here. Thanks. Um, I'll just start if that's okay with you, Quint De Quincy. Um, you know, first of all, I wanna thank Jess so much for her great comments and the great presentation that she gave us. And so many important points were given to us. Um, and, you know, some of the most important were around parity of uh, pay and around reporting structures for peer supporters. and. Um, these are things that we've um, been working with for years at RI International and have that kind of a reporting mm -hmm. up to peers throughout our organization. But, uh, you know, I want to just say back uh, when I first started doing this work in 2000, people didn't even know what peer supporters were. 
So, you know, we have come a long, long way and, you know, the service is growing and changing all the time. And we're beginning to understand more and more the value of peers in every setting uh, that we provide services through in our mental health systems of care. And so, you know, we've gone from not having any funding for peer support or any way to pay for them to bringing in uh, Medicaid as a way to support uh, peer support work. And, you know, these uh, are great things and they also come with some risks so that we can uh, be careful not to pull peer supporters outside their scope of work and not ask them to do licensed required services when they are peer supporters. And so those are some of the important things that I heard from Jess also. However, what we found is that peer supporters are so capable and so strong and so valuable in the most difficult settings that there are. And for instance, you, you all know that we take everyone that is brought to our crisis centers. We never say no. And you know, a lot of people used to think peers don't belong in that setting, but we found that they are a valuable uh, asset to this setting and that we actually don't believe that the work can be done well without them. And so um, we have to keep expanding our mind around what we think about peer support and what we see as they're being, them being able to do as part of their work. Thanks. Yes, thanks Lisa, that, that's really important. Uh, Dr. Lazine, anything you wanna add? Yeah, I also wanted to um, thank Jess for a good, um, presentation that was well organized and brought together a lot of key concepts. Um, I did want to emphasize as well one thing that she said, which was that the presence of a peer um, on site is not the same as having a peer report, uh, peer support response. Um, if that person is there as secondary or ancillary, um, then it's not really a peer support response. Um, I did want to question though, if we um, only want to have people who agree with us, um, partially because who was us? Um, if everybody's on the same side, everybody's on the same team, and we have um, pretty equal representation, then we should all be us. Um, and so for success, everybody has to be kind of on that same page about what's going to take place. I think that we should kind of create that page in a, in a co-creation, um, having a rigorous and respectful and open dialogue, um, and have something that is a collaborative and um, potentially compromising um, process to come together to decide what that page is going to look like um, so that when we do the crisis response, everybody can be on that same page. Yes, thank you, Dr. Lazine. I think that's so important, that language of us versus them. And so making sure that we're having an inclusive environment where peers are already a part of that. And so there's hopefully less of that tension of who is us. A great reminder. Um, and I also just want to uh, fully introduce Jess, I apologize um, that I did not, uh, but Jess Stolman Rainey is the Director of Programs within Rocky Mountain Crisis Center. Uh, Rocky Mountain Crisis Center is also part of the Lifeline Network, so Vibrant is uh, really grateful for all your work. Um, Jess, was there anything around uh, your introduction that I missed or you wanted to share with folks? Um, well, no, I, I run our uh, peer support line as well as our crisis line in Colorado. So um, that's my background, but that's enough. Great. And then I will bring in um, uh, Richard, uh, if you wanted from the same perspective to add anything to the roundtable discussion here. Only that I think it's a, a fantastic, uh, you know, discussion. Um, that is, you know, could not be more um, important, you know, and um, I want to thank both Jess and Quincy um, um, and, and all those who have participated, um, you know, in, in this. The Lifeline began back in 2005 from the very start to try to incorporate people with lived experience, suicide, those who had attempted suicide and others. Um, and SAMHSA's work closely um, with Eduardo Vega and, and others with the task force and the Action Alliance to develop the document, The Way Forward. Um, and so we continue to be committed to these efforts. 
Great, thank you, Richard. Um, well, this is like a first in uh, the GM history where we have just a little bit more time. We're not right up against one. So I'm gonna keep us rolling to the next slide. Um, and you'll see starting next week, we're um, going to be incorporating, uh, again, making the GM more accessible and inclusive for folks. Uh, so Steve Ham Hammerdinger will be um, here. We'll also be providing more supports for the deaf and hard of hearing community, including um, uh, close, better captioning options as well as um, American Sign Language. So very excited for that to start um, September 8th. Uh, and then we'll have September 15th, it's a special meeting for the Nashville summer meeting. Um, uh, Dr. Hepburn or Megan, did, any, uh, did you all wanna have a, a quick um, chat about the meeting? Uh, let me just say that uh, uh, what we thought, we, this is our annual meeting and it's obviously virtual, it's over five days. But um, we think that the Wednesday Jam is so important. We have incorporated it into our annual meeting. And uh, we want our, uh, the people that usually come to our annual meeting to be able to find out how important this Wednesday meeting is. So uh, uh, we, we think it'll, it, in terms of communication, it will be very good. And we're looking forward to participating on that Wednesday. So thank you, Laura. Thank you, and thank you all for the work you guys are doing with that, that meeting. That's gonna be a really great conference and hopefully folks can attend. Um, the 22nd, we'll have Dr. Reed from the Surgeon General's uh, 2001 Proclamation and Forward as the feature presentation. And then the 29th, uh, Amy Cohen with SMI Advisor and Crisis Planning Online. Next slide. Um, there's a question in the chat. This uh, crisis jam is recorded, and again, you can get the uh, all the crisis jam videos at talk.crisisnow slash learning community, and the most recent video will be right at the end of the page, so you can scroll right down. Uh, Vibrant uh, is pleased to be partnering along with, I think, SAMHSA and then Action Alliance and others um, on Amer Moving America's Soul on Suicide Episode, episode 3. Uh, we're very excited for this and uh, hope folks can take some time to watch. Uh, the link is there, masosfilm.com. Next slide. And then again, uh, just wanted to make sure that folks were aware of the Crisis Now uh, library resources, and that includes the SAMHSA's behavioral guidelines for uh, behavioral health care crisis, kind of the best practices toolkits that outlines the three um, kind of best practices in crisis care, having someone to talk to uh, through the crisis centers, having someone to respond, and ideally that's a mobile crisis team, uh, and having a place to go that's not jail, the inappropriate use of a hospital emergency department. So if folks aren't aware of that, just want to make sure that you all are aware that that's out there. This is all available at crisisnow.com slash library. So hopefully this has been a fun jam. It's been informative. I know uh, there's some big shoes to fill with David not here, uh, but hopefully I've done a good job with the baton and I'm looking forward to passing it off next week. Uh, to Vic Armstrong, so well, he will be the uh, host. So thank you all so much. Uh, we'll have this uploaded on uh, talk.crisisnow.com slash learning community soon. Um, and you know, look forward to seeing you all next week.